Welcome everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Okay, I think I know how to start. I'm known for doing things kind of off script. So here we go. When I can read my title clear to mansions in the sky, I'll bid farewell to my home on high. Mansions in the sky. I'll bid farewell to my home down here, to mansions in the sky. That's an old spiritual. And it talks about when I can read my title clear. One of the major struggles in the African-American community historically has been to have access to education. And the song is sort of a layman because it says, when I'm able to read, that is the day I'll be able to read the title on my mansion on high. One of the things about education in communities of color, in particularly African-American community, was that reading was sacred, education was sacred. And we are still today grappling with that sacredness and that, that goal of having educational equality. Welcome to the Black and Brown State of Affairs in 2020. This is a student panel discussion on the intersection of race, politics, and education. We would like to welcome everyone to our student forum today. We have a wide range of individuals out there in the audience today from various sectors of society. We appreciate, you. We appreciate your support. We have Dr. Jenny Fair. She's the Dean of the College of Education and Leadership in Northern Kentucky University, my colleagues. We have my, all of my colleagues in the College of Education, other colleagues at NKU in the History Department in the Black Studies Program, Dr. Eric Jackson. We have some colleagues from Cincinnati Public Radio and uh, NPR Democracy and Me program, Chris Phelps and Julie Copen. So we have a wide range of people here today. It's more of a community conversation. Uh, we have First Antioch Baptist Church and, and, and all of the, uh, my friends and family, Ioana from Action Tank, community members. So we thank you for coming out and tuning in. The benefit of, one benefit of COVID-19 is we have these forums that we perhaps would not have been able to reach as many people or have access to many people or have access to this kind of information. So we are grateful to be in this setting. So let us just move forward. So I'm, some of you know me, most of you know me, I'm Dr. David Childs. I'm Associate Professor of Social Studies and History. My areas of research are Social Studies Education, Black Studies, Theology, and African American History. And so I'll be drawn from that lens today. But my role here today is the faculty advisor of our student group, the Black and Brown Educators of Excellence. And it's a dynamic group, and I'm going to say more about that. So this is where you come in as the audience. I want you to pay close attention. Go ahead and get a pen or pull up your cell phone and, and pull up the memo because I'm gonna give you some things to do and this is gonna be interactive. I'm gonna give you three things to do, okay? As the audience, that's you out there, okay? The first thing I want you to do is post quotes or comments that you pick up from the discussion or interesting points or questions on Facebook and Twitter using one of the hashtags above. And so you can go to Facebook or Twitter or any multi, social media platform where you can use a hashtag, use the hashtag BB of V or Black and Brown Educators of Excellence. And when you hear something, you will hear many brilliant things from our panelists today. When you hear something that you like or that you want to uh, pick up or that is interesting to you, please post it on social media so the public can hear the great time we're having. Okay, does that make sense? All right, I can't see the audience out there, but if you're with me, give me a thumbs up. Okay, panelists, give us a thumbs up. Come on, panelists, let's all give that thumbs up. All right, cool. Second piece, 
please post comments during our discussion, okay? On the discussion board throughout the talk. Post questions and comments, because at the end of the talk, we're gonna reserve about 20 minutes or so to uh, 20, yeah, about 20 minutes, give or take, um, to answer your questions. And if you, I can say your name if you want, um, I can give you a shout out with your question or, or maybe you don't want me to say anything, just indicate that. Um, questions, comments, even something that you liked or something that stood out to you or ju just a thought, okay? And then at the end, number three, so first is the hashtag. Two, questions, comments for the discussion board. Three, there'll be assignment at the end and I'll give that to you momentarily. You're gonna have to hold tight on the assignment. Um, what is the Black and Brown Educators of Excellence? Just briefly, in the interest of time, it is a student group that was founded some years ago at North Kentucky University, I think about four or five years now, by Brandy Mulligan and also Erica Watson and Dr. Portia Irvin Robinson. We were all sitting around and we thought, wow, African American education is very important. In fact, there's a lot of historical aspects of education in and of itself as it relates to black and brown communities. And so we thought we would form a group with students to uh, be about the business of black and brown education, black and brown uh, education. So uh, some of the things we do, uh, recruitment and retention of black and brown students at Northern Kentucky University and support. We provide support, but also to black and brown alumni but the larger project is we know that there is a shortage of black and brown teachers in the K-12 system and at the university system as well. So the larger project is to provide more people of color in the field of education. Why is that important? We know that a good teacher is a good teacher. We know that, we know a good teacher, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, uh, Asian, African-American, uh, Native American, what have you. Um, but studies show that when you have teachers that look like you, when you have teachers that can identify with you, and also they bring a different cultural perspective, we're all smarter. And so in other words, diversity makes us all smarter. When we learn about people from different backgrounds, I'll give you an example. When I taught a summer class, one of the classes I teach is called Racism and Sexism at Educational Institutions. When I taught in the summer, um, I had a lot of students from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, from the Middle East, and I hadn't ever known that uh, large percentage of students from the Middle East. When I got to know them, I was smarter. I could read in the book all I want about those individuals, but when I got to know them, it made me smarter. So the mission is, is just that, to be about the business of black and brown education. Okay, and this is another part you can play. For, the, for our Northern Kentucky University campus community, um, we would love to have you be involved with BBV. You do not have to be an education major, just show an interest in education, okay? And I'm gonna talk about micro-credentials at the end, um, how you can get a certification in education and be another major. And if you just like to teach in the corporate setting, I've already gotten to it. I said I was gonna wait, but um, BBV is currently accepting applications of new members. Please email me at childsd1 at nku.edu. And hopefully I'll get a chance to post that in the chat, but there it is, childsd1 at nku.edu, okay? Um, my first, my last name, d1 at nku.edu. Email me even, even if you have interest. Those outside of the Northern Kentucky University community, you can support financially. You can support the student group financially, and you can email me for information on that. Okay, the rationale for this panel. Uh, how do we understand the intersection of education, politics, and history as they relate to black and brown communities? Intersection, the interconnectedness of education, politics, and history. How are they connected? I'm glad you asked. We have a pandemic on multiple fronts today. We have the pandemic that is COVID-19, but we also have a continued pandemic of racial inequality in the United States today. With the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and many more 
that 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 we could name that we really don't have the time to even name, but we have so many deaths today of, of black men, black and brown men and women by the hands of law enforcement. Timothy Thomas in Cincinnati, um, different, uh, Mike Brown, I could go on and on, Eric Garner. Uh, with the deaths of these individuals, we saw a hopeful and renewed awakening, a sort of wokeness of sorts from some people, but also we saw on the flip side, a digging in of racist heels from others. It was long before 1619 that the first slaves arrived on North America's American shores. Most don't realize that the, some of the first black folks came to Spanish Florida long before 1619. But we point to 1619 to talk about those first black bodies that arrived at Jamestown, Virginia. And with that came, as they stayed around, a spirit of racism began to be disseminated up through history, through the Revolutionary War, through the Civil War, through Reconstruction, through the Jim Crow era, the Civil Rights era, and on to today. This spirit of racism, this seed of racism affects every aspect of lives of people of color. In order to get at true unity, we have to understand co communities of color. We can't just ex uh, have people not talk about it but we have to tell our story. It affects us today. It even affects education today. So we have assembled some intellectuals from the Northern Kentucky University today, these talented youths of color. Often when we see young people portrayed, it's in a negative light, young people of color, but today we have brought the cream of the crop and they're gonna share their knowledge and wisdom with us on today, okay? And so now we're gonna hear from them I'm going to ask them questions and I'm going to ask them to speak nice and loudly and we're going to make it do what, we, what it does, like we always say. Okay, so uh, Stephanie Correa, we're going to start with you, just with the introductory part. Introduce yourself, your name, hometown, major, year at NKU, plans, interests after college, and campus activities. Well, hello, my name is Estefania Correa. I am from Berea, Kentucky, born and raised Eastern. I call myself a Mexican Appalachian. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a member of the Latinx community. My parents immigrated from Morelia, Michoacan in Mexico, and I was born here in the United States. You know, I'm lucky enough to have that privilege. Um, I'm a junior here at Northern Kentucky University. Uh, I am a geology major with a minor in astronomy, the focus in planetary science. I am a planetarium lecturer and researcher here, and as well as a student worker for the uh, Office of Latino Programs and Services and a mentor, hyper mentor uh, for LAMP. My interests after college, uh, I want to continue educating uh, people of all ages and backgrounds in planetary science, earth science, and just encouraging minorities to get into STEM. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, Darius, um, your, your, introduce yourself, hometown major, interests, after college, campus activities. All right. So my name is Darius Butler. <clears throat> I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, right across the river. I'm currently a junior computer information technology major with a minor in business information systems. And some of the things I'm involved with on campus include me being a NKU Rocks mentor. I'm a resident assistant for the NKU Rocks LLC. Um, and I'm also a peer coach for the College of Informatics Advising Center. I'm also the vice president of Black Men's Organization. And I'm also currently a technology intern at Kroger. Um, and then just a couple of things that I plan to do after college. I don't necessarily know exactly where I want to go. But I have a huge passion for helping people. And so what I kind of want to do is um, combine my interest with technology and pair that with my passion to help other individuals as well. So, Wow, technology. Uh, I often say technology is the wave of the future, um, especially with everything being Zoom now. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, just as a pause, someone asked me uh, to post a hashtag again. Here we go. Um, and then, yes, please go ahead and type your questions and comments in the Q&A, please do that. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Ashley. 
and uh, Miss Yolanda Williams. Uh, I don't know if they want me to give them a shout out, but I did. So there it is. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, we're going to hear, hear from Danielle. Um, same question, hometown name, major, uh, plans uh, after college and uh, campus activities. Yes, sir. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Danielle Polian, and I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I think it broke up for a second. Can you guys hear me? I don't know if it goes. Yes. Okay. We hear you. My name is Danielle Polian. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and my major is electronic media and broadcasting, and I am a junior on campus. And my involvement, I am a part of the media services crew. I work with ESPN Productions under media services. And I'm also a lead NKU Rocks mentor, a part of BWO. And I'm also a presidential ambassador on campus. After I graduate, mm -hmm. I plan to go into radio and television news, whichever one. So. Thank you so much. All right. Um, and then we have Sydney Locke. Hi, everybody. My name is Sydney Locke. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I am an elementary education major and I am a senior here at NKU. After college, um, as of right now, I plan to receive my certification in Kentucky as well as Ohio. And then after that, I plan to start my job search um, in one of those states and to become an elementary educator. And some campus activities that I'm involved in is I am the president of Black and Brown Educators of Excellence. I'm involved in New Epsilon Black Women's Honorary, um, Gifts, Bible Study, Gifts Bible Study, which is God is for Today's Students. And I am a resident assistant as well. Awesome, thank you so much. And uh, Sydney's the president of Black and Brown Educators of Excellence, which is the organization that's housing this whole talk. So. Uh, good person to know and connect with. All these young people are. Um, okay, Janae, you ready? Let's hear it. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Janae Cofield. I am from Louisville, Kentucky. My major is public relations and I'm a double minor in black studies and communications. Um, after I graduate, I am a senior. So after I graduate, I'm currently applying to UNC Charlotte in hopes to get into their communications program and focus on social advocacy. Um, some of the things that I'm involved in is uh, I'm the vice president of New Epsilon Black Women's Honorary. I am a member of the NAACP. I'm a ROCKS mentor, and I'm also an RA, and also the secretary for the National Association for, National Association for Black Journalists. Uh, amazing, amazing. Do, do, you, do you guys see why I invited uh, these panelists? Uh, they're, they're brilliant. And so we're going to get uh, more into some of the questions because we I want to hear how you got to where you are today. A lot of people, there's a saying in, in uh, communities of color, you don't know my struggle. And a lot of people will look at you and say, wow, he or she, they have it all together. Uh, they, uh, they're they smart, beauty and brain. So let's help us understand how you got to where you are today. How'd you get to where you are today? What obstacles did you overcome? And I think I'll go in order again because I think I want to hear from everybody on this one. And so, Stephanie Correa, can you please uh, just talk about how you got to where you are today and what maybe some obstacles that you went through to overcome? Sure. Thank you, Ryan. I'd love to discuss this really important topic. So I um, mentioned earlier that I am the daughter of immigrants. My parents did cross without documentation. It was a very brutal. Um, experience for them. I'm sure my mom was actually five months pregnant with my oldest brother, Humberto. So we are a very low income family. My parents had to learn English very quickly to just, I guess, lessen the discrimination they faced. Watching that growing up was difficult to see how people hated us for no reason and yet would select parts of our culture to love and enjoy. Um, you know, I originally started out in a very uh, I guess, bad side of town area. And then my father moved and we moved to Berea, Kentucky. And Berea, Kentucky is famous for Berea College. It's a very inclusive, diverse area. And luckily it's full of educated minds. And, you know, we see that with more education, there's less discrimination, biases are erased with the more you learn. And so I was put in a place where I was 
safe as a minority. And, you know, the college was very uh, helpful in giving me my character traits, teaching me, you know, the importance of knowing my culture. And I think the biggest thing that helped was that I was involved in a lot of mentor programs when I moved to Buriat in high school. And it's why I'm in college today. So I am the woman I am now. And it's why I use my voice as much as I can. Um, without that college, I would definitely not be where I am today. I've learned a lot of valuable lessons. Um, you know, this is a panel about education and I had a very hard time in um, elementary school. I feel like elementary school is the most racist experience of any minority's life. I can, you know, I, I truly believe that because the things I endured there was, and it was incredibly horrible. You know, um, I felt very unseen and just, I felt like people didn't care and I, you know, it was just a hard time, so. Let, let me ask a follow-up question, then I want to uh, go to Darius. What are things teachers could have done to support you in that situation or not have done? Uh, what are things, what are, uh, you, you understand what I'm saying, yeah. Yes, of course. Um, so, you know, one of the bigger struggles I had growing up was my name. Uh, my name is Estefania, you know, <laughs> it's, I, I get told a lot that's a pretty name and I think it's fun to say. Um, you know, starting out, I think my earliest memory of this school in second grade was my teacher came up to me, she was very old, um, and she told me how she didn't feel like pronouncing my name, so she said that she was going to call me Stephanie from now on, mm -hmm. and she told the rest of the class to call me Stephanie, and, you know, then a couple of days go by, and she tells me that she, yeah, I kept spelling my name as Estefania, but uh, she said that I had to change my name to Stephanie, so I changed it to S-T-E-P-H-A-I-N-N-I-E, and I had it that way until um, I want to say like eighth grade until one day I just put it back to Estefania, but still like what she did couldn't be undone and students still refused to call me Estefania and they just kept using the same excuse of, I don't feel like pronouncing your name, like it's too hard, we're just going to call you Stephanie. And, you know, I kept, I, I really thought that was normal. You know, no one ever stepped up and said that this is not right until my junior year. I had a teacher, she was white, teaching US history. And I told her my name was Stephanie because everybody called me that and there was no point. Um, and she said, well, what's your like actual name? And I was like, well, Stefania. And she was like, well, I prefer to call you that to keep you close to your cultural roots. And you know, that was just a game changer. I, you know, to this day, she's the most memorable person from that school, from that part of my life, because I don't think people understand how much power words have. And, you know, it, it meant a lot coming from a white teacher. It really meant a lot because I just, I, I can't even put into words how grateful I am because it set the standard in her class. And so I felt safe in that class. Wow, thank you so much. Wow, wow, I, I could say so much, but I'm not. It's, this is your time. Brother Butler, can you help me out? Well, talk about just how'd you get to where you are today? What obstacles did you overcome? Yeah, so um, I have to credit a large part of my um, where I am today to my mother and father. Um, I grew up in all predominantly white areas all the way up till now. And so really my parents were my rock going through all of that and really educating me. And um, throughout my elementary school and um, middle school in general, I felt like, you know, the education system necessar didn't necessarily, you know, push me to where I am today. It was my parents that helped me. My dad, dad is actually a um, eighth grade social studies teacher. So he used to help me with all my homework and stuff like that and really just, you know, push me through and give me the real when I really needed it. And um, kind of like um, he was saying before, Elementary school can be rough. I still have experiences like um, that I went through from second grade that I still remember today where I was falsely accused of stealing something and the administrative and everything got involved. And it was just because that the lunch lady thought she saw something and it wasn't true. And so it's just like situations like that where I had to get my, my parents had to get involved and stuff like that. And that stuff can be really traumatizing. I mean, second grade, like, you know, stuff like that, you know, I still remember today and that's something I'm going to carry with me through the rest of my life. I'm going to be talking to my kids like, you know, I remember this one time when I was in second grade where this happened to me and whatnot. And so it's just stuff that can't be turned around. 
And so that's one of the struggles that I will firmly remember going forward. And then along with my parents supporting me, I would have to say up until now, um, programs such as NKU Rocks and uh, Mr. Yates, who is the director of African-American Student Initiatives has really brought me to where I am today and helped me through college because I, as I said, I've been in, I've been the minority in everything. So, you know, growing all the way up. And so being able to get exposed to rocks and be around people who are like me and who look like me and just be exposed to that and be accepted is something that has really allowed me to thrive where I am today and really be able to adapt to really any situation that I go through moving forward. So. Dr. Charles, you're on mute. I muted myself. I knew I was going to forget. Um, I, I was just saying, uh, well said, man. You, you're helping so many people. Um, I can identify as, as an African American male. What you said. Um, speaking of uh, Danielle, can you please share, how, how, sister, how you get to where you got today? All we see is the end product. Tell us about the struggle. Uh, the struggle, <laughs> yes, sir. Um, well, I think I'm kind of like Darius in terms of um, just my story. I definitely have to dedicate a lot of my success and just the way that I grew up to my parents and kind of like what Estefania was talking about, uh, both my parents went to Berea College. So I am a product of that school. I love, uh, they love Berea and they talk about it all the time. In fact, my dad is now a college recruiter for Berea. He went back to his mm -hmm. alma, alma mater. So um, they definitely talk about it all the time and they tell me the stories and it's definitely <laughs> been a part of me growing up and hearing all of those things and being able to say I'm a second generation college student. You know, we give a lot of props to first generations and they do a great job. Um, but for myself, you know, being able to say like my mom and dad went through this, like if they can do it and I can do it, it has definitely made my journey um, a lot easier. Um, and for Darius and Estefania talking about elementary school, I actually had a really good elementary school experience. Right, um, right. I know that I met a lot of great people and uh, it was a lot of African-Americans that went to the school. My cheerleading team that I was a part of was mainly uh, all black team, pretty much mainly minorities. In fact, Sydney was on the team with me. That's where we met each other. So definitely have that memory and we're still friends obviously right now, so that's great. But my worst experience was definitely middle school. Middle school was horrible. Hated middle school. Besides the people I met, it was kind of hard. And I know I had a teacher who was white and she did not like me. I think I was just, you know, a lot of, a lot of people do like me. So I, maybe she just didn't like me because everyone else did. Or she was just like, you're not special. So um, she definitely gave me a hard time. And I think there was a situation where I, she was over the beta club, the National Society, the National Honor Society or the beta club. And I turned in some hours and she said that I lied about where I got my hours from. Mm -hmm. So that was just really hard. And my parents definitely had to get involved with that situation, kind of like Darius and just set the record straight. And then also I know that I wanted to go to a high school called DuPont Manual, which is the number one high school in Kentucky. And I was rejected from that, even though I had like a 3.7 GPA in middle school and I worked really hard. So I ended up going to Seneca High School, which is not uh, typically on the charts for being the highest school in terms of academics and things like that. And at first I was really depressed. I wanted to get into the journalism and communication program, which is what I'm studying here in college, but you know, yeah. I got rejected for that program wow. in high school. And I was so upset about it. I just felt like my world was over and my parents really just pushed me to allow me to know like the school doesn't make you, you make the school. So I, I worked really hard. I made sure I was involved in everything. And you know, a lot of people that go to manual say the manual high school. Well, I went to the Seneca and I graduated and you know, I made sure I made it the absolute best experience that I could. And it helped me to get a scholarship to go to NKU, it helped me to be where I am today. So that's definitely my story. Well, that's incredible. Um, I love hearing your story. Wow. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm just, even a as a person from a different generation, 
I went through a lot of the similar things that you guys have gone through. Um, somebody asked uh, about the chat feature. I think the chat feature is not, uh, is disabled. You want to, uh, if you have a comment or question, please put it in the question and answer. Please put that in the question and answer. Um, and if you're struggling with that, you can send me an email, childsd1 at nku.edu. We definitely want your questions, your comments. Uh, put it right in the in the Q and A. Okay. Uh, let's hear from uh, Janae. Uh, just how how how'd you get to where you are today? Um. So unlike the rest of the panel, I actually owe a lot of my success to uh, a lot of my mentors and counselors growing up because I don't have that close of a relationship with my family. So essentially, like they were the ones who got me through, like applying to college, applying to, um, I did the governor's scholars program. Um, pretty much they encouraged me through all of those things and helped me get to where I am today. Um, growing up, I'm from a, like a middle-class family, but we grew up in like, I grew up in like an all white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So like my family was the, uh, like we, there was only three black families in the neighborhood. So a lot of the time we were targeted. So like, I remember when we first moved out of that like neighborhood someone broke into our house and like spray painted like the n-word and everything like wow. that in our houses and everything so like at a young age I realized like racism really does exist and then also in elementary school because I know we're bringing up like uh our school like what happened mm -hmm. to us yeah, I yeah. remember being called Janene after the Martin Lawrence character Shanene and at wow. first like and it was adults calling me this and I would be the only black girl in like the class or any or something and pretty much like at first I thought it was funny because you know being like a five or four year old you're like oh like that rhymes or like something like that but like looking back on it I'm like essentially they were like trying to because the characteristics of the character is like ghetto loud right so on and so forth and then also over time I was uh I was labeled as the Oreo or the white girl uh so pretty much black on the outside white on the inside so I always got like in school always was like oh you're not black enough or you're too white and I remember going into um my middle school because I transferred middle schools and when I went to the new middle school there was only other and I was in uh, advanced placement courses so there was only one other black girl in these classes and then she came up to me and she was like oh I got excited because I thought that we were going to have another black girl but you're just another white girl and like middle school is a very influential time in my opinion so like, that's when I started changing the way I dressed. I changed the way I talked. I changed everything about me just try to just to try to fit in. And essentially I did like go into like the stereotypical like black girl just to fit in. I was still making good grades, still doing that. But like I had attitudes. I just wanted to like talk back to people. But over time that changed. And then I actually went to the Louisville Central High School which in Louisville is pretty much a predominantly black or historically black high school. So I went there and that's when my like, I fell in love with black history. I fell in love with black people because I realized there's so many different versions of us. And so that's ultimately why I also became a black studies uh, minor as well. So that's just been my experience over time. Um. I had an a individual that said, uh, can, can you guys see all the panelists? Can you chime in for me for a second? Uh, I think somebody said they can only see some of us. Can you guys see all the panelists? That's a question I have for, for the, uh, the audience really quickly. Can you see all the panelists? Let me know that. That would be helpful. Um, OK. Okay, currently the attendees are only seeing that. Okay, I got it, I know what to do. There you go. Cool. All right, um, these are the lovely people that have been talking. Um, thank you so much, Janae. Um, wow, what you said about Janae was really, that, that stings. Um, let's hear from Sydney. Uh, can you talk about uh, you, how you got to where you are today? Um, yes, so like Danielle and Darius said, I owe all my success and the woman I am becoming to my parents. 
Um, they have always told me to keep education first and they have always encouraged me as well as supported me. Um, just like Danielle said, my elementary school experience was very good. I would say it was good um, elementary to high school, honestly. I think my biggest struggle um, is academics. So like ACT, I struggled with the ACT. And for me, that was a very big, um, I would say a disappointment at the time, just because scholarships was everything to me, everything to my family. And to know that I was gonna be based on, I guess you could say my score was just very disappointing just because I think I took it like four times and the first two times I got the same score. And then the second two times I went up like one point and I got the same score as well. So um, the ACT was my biggest struggle. And I think if I had more, more support in areas for example, like maybe um, black mentors or just anything like that in the education field who could help me out, then I would have done a little bit better on that um, because I saw in the future how it hindered me as well with the praxis. Um, if you're familiar with education, you do have to take a praxis test to get just in the College of Education and then you have to take a praxis too to get your certification. And I really, really, really struggled with my praxis core to where um, it pushed my graduation date back. So I am a fifth year and it also um, made me pay more tuition, of course, and just, just things like that. But if I had people in the College of Education who looked like me and were able to um, guide me in that direction maybe earlier than just my junior year, then I think I would have been more successful um, because that was a struggle for me and that was a down point because it really made me question my purpose. It made me question if I was even worth being an educator. I was thinking if I can't even pass this test, like what kids are going to listen to me? What students are even going to um, gain anything from me? So that was really my biggest struggle was just like test taking skills and um, things like that. So Sydney, that, that's a really, I'll, I'll ask a, a follow-up question. Um, how did you overcome that? You, you're obviously doing very well. You're an education major. You're getting teacher certification. You are a senior. Um, how, what would you say to folks in terms of how you got to where you are and making it through those obstacles? Um, reaching out your resources. I used everybody in the College of Education to make sure that I passed the test. Um, my professor actually this semester, um, Professor Funda, she really helped me um, pass the math section of my test. Is, um, that's the area that I really struggled with, but just reaching out to resources like Dr. Childs, um, Dr. McNeil, who is no longer at NKU, but just reaching out to have, find that encouragement and that support um, for these tests is what helped me. Um, not giving up, honestly, because I feel like we get very discouraged when um, we don't see our outcome at the beginning, but that doesn't mean that that's gonna be um, your scenario at the end. So for example, I took my praxis, just one section of it on Friday and I passed it the first time. And you can go back on your Praxis ETS scores and you can see all the tests that you took. And just for the core, I probably took like six tests. And so it was just very, a really good feeling to see that if you don't give up and you use your resources and the people around you, um, you can get where you want to get. All right, um, and let, let, let's, let's, let's take it a step further, let, let's, let's go deeper. Uh, we talked about multiple pandemics. Uh, we talked about, uh, we mentioned this, uh, this idea of a pandemic as it relates to COVID-19, but also a, rate, a pandemic of racism. And even COVID-19, it affects black and brown communities at a much uh, uh, worse uh, rate as it does mainstream communities. Um, in what ways uh, are you impacted by the, let's say the current political climate, the racial climate, um, how have you felt about that? The, the, in my opinion, the blatant racism that we see in the media, um, to what extent uh, has that affected you? Um, and just speak on it any way you feel. Whoever wants to take that can go first. Um, can you, 
I can go ahead and go. Yes, please. Um, so for me personally, with being a black woman from Louisville, Kentucky, I feel like I've been extremely like impacted by the racial climate this summer. Um, myself and a lot of my friends were involved with the protest just because um like Brianna Taylor's murder and the verdict extremely upset me. It even like caused me to not do my work for a couple of days once I heard the verdict, because it was very much like it made me feel like my city did not care about me, even though like I like if you see like a lot of students who are from Louisville, we take pride in Louisville. Like being from Louisville, we'll say <laughs> it's the Derby City. Like we'll like say all that stuff. But then like I was like, I really been like having so much pride for a city that does not care. And then also with the whole political climate also going on as well, I have been terrified. I'm also an RA, so when they were trying to decide who was going to win this election. Myself and my other uh, RA co-workers, we were in the group message. You can, me and Darius are on the same team. Pretty much, we were asking, like, can someone do duty rounds with me? I don't feel comfortable. Like, we were in danger for our safety just because of the political political climate that we're in today. So, yeah, it's pretty much like I feel like I'm in fear, and I feel like I'm not appreciated, even though I have plans to give back to my community. Wow, you you brought the fire, Janae. Wow, and uh, man, we. Uh, this is awesome. Okay, uh, Darius, you take that question. Go ahead, brother. Take that. And then I'm gonna hear from Estefania. <laughs> yeah, so um, for me, it's just been, I think it's been eye-opening and educational for me in a way because I've been able to see people's true colors over the past six months. And it's really been like, you really can realize and recognize who's down for you and who's not. And, um, and I think that's something that's been very helpful going forward. On the flip side, though, it has been rough because, like, just everything that's going on, like, I've been um, – it's like an off and on switch for me. One day I'll be doing good, and the next day it's like, oh, you know, it's not, not doing as good today. It's one of those days or whatnot. And it's just a constant battle with just everything that's going on and to a point where you honestly kind of have to, like, shut the TV off or shut your phone off or whatnot, because it can be really depressing and put you in a low point of, mind, mm -hmm. uh, point of mind. And I think the biggest thing is just seeing people blatantly deny my blackness in public. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the biggest things. It's like, you know, and like we've gotten to such a polarized society where we've stopped realizing that we're human beings, you know, and just not finding ways where we can compromise and get along with one another. And it's just, it's just, it can be really sad at times. So just, you know, being able to kind of get away from that, like I've had to kind of, um, you know, I've been so busy lately that I haven't had the opportunity to like, you know, watch some shows or, you know, play some video games and stuff like that. And this week I've like started making time where I can kind of do that fun stuff so I can kind of get my mind off of things and, you know, right. get away from certain things and just de-stress a little bit because it all can build up, and, you know, and it'll get to the point where you're not in a good state of mind, so, from a mental health standpoint. Yeah, good stuff, man. It, uh, there's a term called uh, historic racial trauma, and there, there's there's some, some research out, there's newer research out about racial trauma current and historical. That's what I'm thinking about as you guys are talking. Uh, Stephania, can you uh, go ahead and flow? What you, what you think? Yeah, you know, um, a lot of the things that I'm feeling, I felt four years ago as a member of the Latinx mm -hmm. community, specifically as a Mexican. Um, mm -hmm. You know, bouncing off what Janae said, it, it's just like, you know, my paranoia has just shot up exponentially. I'm, I'm so jumpy now. I'm constantly looking over my shoulder because the racial, I don't want to say tension because it's so much more violent than that. You know, it, it, it's just like, it, it, it's really gotten to me. And, you know, when, 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 when I saw the video of this black man being murdered by an officer, and you know, it just, it just, it's so traumatizing because people think that it just because it happened to a black person, it only affects black people, but that's not the case because, because when you're racist, when you attack someone for the way they look, their appearance, their identity, their culture, you attack all of us. Mm. And the feeling of dread of fear was just so prominent for so long. And, 
it was just unbelievable. And then for so many people that I know, people around me, people here in the administration and everywhere to just be so silent on it, like that hurt more mm. than anything. And it, it just made me feel so unsafe. And, you know, specifically like in my experience as a Latina woman, you know, my parents are undocumented. My family is undocumented. My friends are undocumented. I have friends on DACA, I have friends without DACA. And, you know, just because I have papers doesn't make me feel safe at all. It gives me such little comfort because I don't have papers because I just, I, I feel like my people are being dehumanized. Mm. You know, they're being called illegal aliens. People can't be illegal when we're not aliens. Um, wow. It just feels very like violent and attacked. And for a while I couldn't, I couldn't do work either. You know, like it's, how can you expect me to do work when, you know, people that look like me who are me are being hurt, murdered, hated. It's just like the racism to me, it's, I feel it's a very physical thing. Like I feel physically attacked. I feel violated. I feel almost harmed when something like this happens. And so it really had a negative effect on me and my community. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm, I'm a crier. I'm almost in tears. I had to hold it back. Um, just all of y'all, wow, it's like, it bubbles up, and it's like, the humanity, you know, this should, this should all uh, pull our strings as humans. This is, these issues we're talking about, they're, they're not just Black issues, they're not just Hispanic issues, it's a human rights issue, that's what I want the audience to, to think about. Uh, uh, anybody else want to, want to talk about that in terms of uh, the, the, the political climate today, the racial climate that hasn't gone yet? I can kind of add on that, like yeah. kind of uh, what Estefania was talking about in terms of just how, just because if you're not black, it doesn't, it doesn't have an, it does have an effect on you in terms of the things that happen racially in America. And I definitely agree, even from the Mexican Latina community in terms of like mm. the DACA program. So DACA was a program that came in with the Obama administration. And I have a lot of friends who are part of that pro a product of that program and they are dreamers and I know that it's just really upsetting to me to know that the Trump administration wanted to get rid of this program and really stop immigrants from coming over here and I don't believe that America is what it is today without immigrants without the Latina the Me Mexican community so definitely just you know showing them love and just understanding that I don't have to be a part of another culture to feel um, hurt by other decisions that are made within this country about their race or ethnic background. So I know that that's something that I wanted to mention. And also just like Darius said, talking about how you really got to see people's true colors, especially during this time and just hearing people's opinions. I think social media has really gave mm -hmm. everyone a platform to speak and be able to be comfortable saying whatever they wanna say. And for that reason, you know, you can also choose to block people. I blocked several people after hearing certain opinions or seeing different things. And I think that, you know, we can disagree on opinions. You know, you might like Walmart better than Kroger, whatever, Pepsi versus Coke. We can disagree on, you know, opinions of certain things. But when it comes to humanity, when it comes to racism, when it comes mm -hmm. to you know, blocking up children or just, mm. just basic human rights that everyone is entitled to just as a human being. There's no discussion about that. There's no types of, oh, we, we don't see it the same way. So, mm. you know, like we can definitely agree to disagree. There's no disagree, agreeing to disagree on those subjects. Mm. Um, if I have to block you from my life because I see the way that you feel about those topics that concern everyone and it is what it is. Wow, wow. So I don't wanna cut anybody off because I'm gonna ask one more question after this. Anybody else wanna weigh in that has not before I move on? Okay, last question. And and by the way, if you wanna come back to that, you can. Last question, um, we, uh, we got just a little bit more time then we're gonna get into some audience questions. By the way, audience, this is your opportunity to, to post a question. Uh, we do have some things in the chat already or a statement. 
um, or just uh, whatever's on your heart. Last question. Um, let's reach across the aisle, folks. Um, help our white brothers and sisters understand uh, how, how, how we can work together, how they can understand you better. What, what would you say to them? Um, you've already kind of got into your struggle. Uh, the, this is about unity, um, but unity is not just us being quiet so that people don't feel uncomfortable, but unity is we have to reach across the aisle and we have to tell our story. So uh, what would you say to, to what, what advice would you give Twofold. You can answer it two ways. What advice would you give to our black and uh, to our white brothers and sisters on, um, about uh, helping us understand, help them understand your struggle? Or you can give advice to the youth in general about overcoming obstacles. You can take one of those two if you want. Um, I can go. Oh, yeah. Okay, I can go. Go ahead, ahead Janae. Yes. Um. So pretty much I'm gonna kind of repeat myself what I said last uh, panel I was in, yeah. uh, which is essentially that we're looking, we're not looking for allies, we're looking for comrades. Mm -hmm. So what that meaning yeah. is we are looking for your actions. Like on Facebook, on social media, you can post anything that you want, like saying Black Lives Matter, saying you support this group, you saying you support that group, but what are you doing? In your classrooms, what are you doing to support like your black and brown students? When I come into a classroom, I want to feel like a person. I don't want to feel like a, like someone who's here just to feel like your diversity count. I want to feel like yeah. my opinions are appreciated and I want to feel like I'm a human being. Because again, like Danielle says, um, we are pretty much, we shouldn't have to fight about like human rights. So if I am a human, I should be treated like one, just like anybody else. It doesn't matter my skin color. But yeah, it's pretty much more about your actions than it is about your words. Wow. Wow. Um, I want to recommend a couple of books. I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to give you books. One, um, Is Everyone Really Equal? By Senso and D'Angelo. Is Everyone Really Equal? Um, and then, in fact, um, if one of the panelists could throw that in the chat, when I say books, put it in the chat for me. Um, I, I, I should say Dr. April Eddy. She had a, an illness in the family, so keep her in your thoughts and prayers. She was my, my co-conspirator here, and uh, she was going to uh, run the panelist uh, portion, um, but she got uh, had sickness in the family to the last minute. So is everyone really equal? Uh, White Fragility, you know that book. Um, that um, the, the last chapter is, well, I'm not, I'm gonna let you look, look at the last chapter, tell me what it say, <laughs> email me. Um, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, okay? Um, I'm a reader, so I, you know, we, we can keep going, but uh, those, those are some you wanna take a look at. Black Skins, White Masks, that, that book is, is pretty powerful. That, that's a deep book. Um, From Slavery to Freedom, um, and uh, what's the other one I was thinking of? Um, oh, the new Jim Crow, the new Jim Crow. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. I may say some more later because this is all about education too. Um, the new Jim Crow. Okay, um, what else? What else? What advice would you give? Yes, go ahead, Sydney. Um, mine is kind of simple. I wrote them down while I was thinking of it. Um, I think right now as a start is just attend programs and. Um, learn more and um, engage in conversation because if you don't attend programs um, like this, you're not really gonna be able to experience um, anything or be able to really understand um, what we're talking about. Um, the second one is just to ask questions. I feel like that's just um, a very simple task, but to ask questions, if you're curious, um, ask them. I just feel like instead of holding back or having your own opinion to the side, start asking questions where you may not understand or may or where you want to grow more. Um, like Janae said, just actions. And then for me, um, I would just say get to know us because in class, I mean, it's very obvious we stick out like a sore thumb. Um, we are the minority in the classroom. So sometimes, like Janae said, I want to feel like I'm a human. Oftentimes when I'm in class, like I have a hard time um, finding group members, like if it's a project, if it's not assigned. And I just feel like 
for classmates I'm in a room with for about three years, the same people, I feel like nobody knows me. Nobody knows me at all and nobody is curious to know who I am. And so just getting to know somebody and not being afraid to get to know that person because I feel like often we get these stereotypes, especially me, like um, an angry black woman or just anything like that. And so I feel like when somebody wants to get to know me, hey, maybe even just know where I'm from, it just says a lot about you and that you want to know who I am, except just what I bring on the outside. Whoa. Huh. Wow. She gave some practical uh, advice there. Um, what else? Anyone else? Uh, I've got about two minutes that we'll, folks want to chime in before we go to the, the audience portion. Stephanie. Um, yeah. So, you know, I actually have a white boyfriend and I've been learning a lot on how to, I guess, try to help white people get more involved with the minority community, specifically the Latinx community. And, you know, um, I think something that I found that is really good is to just, if you're white, the first thing I need you to know is that you don't need to be afraid of coming to, you know, LAMP events, like Latino events or African-American events or whatever events, okay? I can, no, like there's no reason to be afraid of approaching a minority. Like, we want you there because when, because the sooner we have these conversations about race, the sooner we can stop having them, you know? And inform yourself. There's so many things that our communities go through that if people just knew more about it, just, it just wouldn't be happening. You know, I know for my community, all of our battles, all of our battles are at the legislative levels, okay? And, you know, it's really difficult for us to raise awareness to protest them because the only people coming are, you know, minorities when, you know, there's way more white people in the United States and there are minorities. And we just need more allies, we need more comrades, as Janae said, you know, show up. Just show up. That's all we need is for you to just show up and join hands with us and fight with us. Because we just, you know, and specifically for like, if you want to, I guess, open up to the Latino community, if you like Mexican food, if you like Spanish, if you want to learn how to bachata, just ask anybody, okay? Because Latinos are some prideful people, okay? When I walk into a classroom and then we're talking about food and I'm going off about tamales, sopes, whatever it is, I would chata and someone's like, oh, that sounds good. And I'm like, let's go get some tacos. Let's go. Like, I, like, if you ever, if you want to be any Latino's friend, just ask them about food or just whatever. Dr. Child, you're still on mute. Yeah. <laughs> the the old man, uh, I could leave, you would think I could turn off mute or turn on my my, but um that's that's our time. That was perfect timing uh, with you guys. Um that's that's our panelists. This the end of the panelist portion. We're gonna go into the audience Q and A portion. Um I would say this. Somebody write this down in the chat, please. Um, these are way just on the tail end of what they said. These are five ways to uh, perhaps these strategies can help us guide students, friends, and relatives in thinking about bias. These are five strategies to combat our internal bias, okay? To combat internal bias. One, stereotype replacement, okay? Replace stereotypes. Two, counter stereotyping, okay? So like you see these students here, they defy the stereotype, okay? Of the, of the shiftless person of color, of the the ignorant person of color, they defy that stereotype. Three, individuation, look at people as individuals. One, stereotype replacement. Two, counter stereotyping. Three, individuation. Four, perspective taking, okay? Look at it from uh, another person's perspective. Five, increased opportunity for contact. That's what they've been saying over and over again. Stereotype replacement, counter stereotyping, individuation, perspective taking, increased opportunities for contact. And that's what this is all about, okay? So um, we got some great questions um, that we're gonna get into. I'll just um, take about 20 minutes here. Um, out, so some are comments, I'll just go down the list. Um, this is from, um, um, oh, from, from our local NPR station, uh, which is cool, from uh, Julie York Colton, she works for uh, Cincinnati Public Radio. Um, outstanding panel, thank y'all. 
How can we in local media better represent, support, and serve Black and Brown educators and students? Um, just contact me, <laughs> and we'll, we'll we'll I think there is a collaboration thing that we could do. These are some brilliant young people, um, and we would love to support. Uh, uh, we would love anybody that wants to support these youth and, and, and uh, highlight their voice because they're teaching us. We're the students, by the way, audience. We're the students right now. They're the teachers, okay? Uh, we're on a listening tour. We're listening to them right now. Um, critical race theory talks about storytelling, the power of storytelling. And um, it's, it's so moving. Uh, Dr. Bowling, um, uh, uh, Associate Dean of Arts and Science at North Kentucky University, she says, uh, love the representation of students from different majors at NKU. Thank you for sharing your stories. Um, uh, Allison says, Daniel, I like the perspective you had that you realized you were treated differently because of your race. How old were you um, when you, oh, that's from Nicole Bates. Uh, how old were you uh, when you had that first experience? Does that make sense? Was that towards me? That was funny. Yes, me. yes, yes. When you, uh, um, how old was I when I experienced the, the situation with lying about the hours in middle school? Yeah. Yes. I was, let's see, I was in the seventh grade. So I was like 13. It's 13. Wow. Middle like, school. Saying you, that out you, loud is just crazy. So, yeah, it's just, um, it was hard. It was tough. And I think just having to hear from her, like, oh, you're not telling the truth or you would make something up. And there were other stories I really can't remember, honestly. But my, I think my dad definitely came down to the school and just had a, a good talking with her and the principal. So that was, it was definitely a time I will never forget. And I think somebody else mentioned like, you know, you always remember the bad teachers, but you right, also remember right. the good ones too. So I think just being in high school or even in middle school, just those having black educators that taught me, I would just always be like, wow, like someone who looks like me is in this position and they're helping me to grow and Huh. I really appreciate it. And just being able to connect with them um, outside of the classroom, just knowing that they've had similar backgrounds to me, it, it was really special. So definitely appreciate Black and Brown educators. Thank you. Uh, Danielle I, I, or, or uh, Janae, I think that was Janae that talked about uh, the Shanae caricature from uh, Martin. Can you talk more about the Blacks, the stereotype of the, the ghetto Black woman? What does that mean and how, why is that dangerous? And, and how, what effect does that have on us? Can, can you speak on that? Um, yeah, so like the character that I was talking about, Shanae from- uh, Martin. Martin. Yeah, uh, so pretty much, like I said, she's loud, she's quote unquote ghetto, ratchet, whatever you wanna like, pretty much the same word for all those type of things. Um, I feel like this is a dangerous uh, stereotype just because not every single person is their own individual. Some people, like mm -hmm. I said, growing up, I was quiet. So I was confused as to why I was even being called that. So pretty much like it's just dangerous because you're grouping a bunch of people and saying like they all act like that. And then at a young age, you're like, so I'm loud, I'm ghetto. And then some people feed into it, like it's internalized, like, oh, I am supposed to act like that. Where some people do like defy it and they say, no, that's not how I'm gonna act and that's not how I act. And then even if people who do act like that, it's still disrespecting them as well. Cause some people are loud and they are like out there in your face, but that's their own personality. That's their own authentic self. And they should be appreciated for that. So people who do act like that are also getting the backhand of the stick too because they're saying like, this is the wrong way on how to like act and everything. But like I said, pretty much everybody's their own individual, like unique person and grouping a bunch of like black people together is that is just like a negative stereotype and representation of us, so. Wow, wow, um, that stereotype is dangerous. Also because uh, along with what you said, um, it's dangerous because it, people are getting killed behind stereotypes. Like if I'm pulled over by an officer, um, like my son and I were pulled over, um, my, my teenage son, um, and um, if they view me as ghetto or a threat, ghetto meaning thug, drug dealer, violent, and then that's gonna 
increase the likelihood of me being assaulted by an officer or killed. Okay, so it is dangerous. Thank you so much for bringing that out. Uh, yes, go ahead. I'd like to add something onto that with that stereotype. So specifically with that very specific stereotype for the um, ghetto black woman, it's extremely dangerous um, psychologically when you say that you're somebody who's not black. Um, you hear that and you know, whether you hear from your parents and then you grow up in a home where that's appropriate and you know, you go on to become a nurse at a hospital. Well, you know, a black woman comes in and she's obviously in some kind of pain. And then, you know, she's, maybe she's being allowed because she's in pain or she's being, you know, she's a little up, like maybe she's upset because she's in the right. hospital in pain. Well, because you had that stereotype ingrained into your psychological uh, brain, when you were younger, you know, as a professional, health professional, you just immediately assume that this is just some ghetto black lady. And then right. because of that, that woman is not going to get the same treatment as your other patients or as anyone else who comes through the doors. And you may have just killed someone. You know, this is something that mm. we see across the board. It, it goes right. on everywhere in America in all hospitals. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, William, uh, William Jones. Uh, hey, William, uh, one of my former students, great guy. He says, uh, he has a brilliant statement. We have diverse students who want to be educators, but may not have the right supports or access to resources. Wow. Example, may not have a professor or a teacher of the same race to help them through school or just to talk. Um, diverse students may not have the financial support to take the practice multiple times, which is very expensive. Um, practice is the exam that you take to get teacher certification. Uh, Dr. Jackson, uh, Dr. Eric Jackson is the uh, director of uh, uh, Black Studies program, uh, right here at North Kentucky, Univers North Kentucky University. Always brilliant. He said, you're awesome. Quote, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Unquote, uh, African proverb. Uh, so, okay. Uh, Mr. Tracy, what are you saying that you want to uh, ask something live? Can somebody do that? Let me know and advise me on what I need to do. Uh, Dean G Jenny Fair of the College of Education, just wanted to thank you for sharing your amazing stories. I'm inspired by your commitment, your hope for a future. Lots of comments, this is incredible. Uh, and your willingness to educate through your experiences. You're educating me, I'm the student today. Um, I really just planned to just listen in, um, but I had duty calls. Uh, Nicole says, I work in healthcare and stereotypes also affect the type of treatment received, which is why COVID is affecting black and brown people disproportionately. Whoa, oh my goodness, healthcare. That, that's, that's, and folks, wear your mask. Uh, I'm gonna call y'all out too. We got these anti-maskers out here that, that are making it political. You need to put your mask on. Trust me, but just put your mask on, quit tripping. All right, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, Will also says, or would it be different because predominantly white school, school students may not be able to see things from a black Hispanic perspective. Um, there was a question I wanna get to. Um, oh, uh, Miss Yolanda Williams. Um, I should say sister Yolanda Williams. Uh, I remember when I was attending college in some of my classes, I felt left out when we were asked to get with someone to do a project. Mostly it was my color and age. She gets into ageism there. Um, that's discrimination against people because they're aged, then the intersectionality of age and color. Um, Dr. Yohi, she's in the arts and sciences, literature professor. She teaches a cool class on African-American literature. You wanna check it out. Um, brilliant panel, individual panelists. Thank you all for your honesty and openness. Uh, Kyrie Donaghy. Um, uh, one of my former students, brilliant, a uh, woman of color. Not only have you seen people's true colors, but you've ultimately gotten to know people's priorities. Justice is simply not a priority for some. Um, Kaylee, uh, one of our current students, she says, thank you for sharing your experiences I, uh, and being vulnerable in these discussions. I appreciate you opening my eyes and letting me know ways that I can be better. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I saw a question. Oh, here we go. Um, as a future elementary educator, what are ways that I can connect with students of the black and brown community and show them that I am genuine without feeling forced? Anybody can take that. How can uh, a white student, uh, a white person, or it doesn't have to be a student, connect with us 
without it being forced. Because there are people that want to connect with us and understand us and befriend us, but sometimes they, they don't know how to approach it. What do you think about that? Anybody can take that. I would say just really individualism, kind of like what Dr. Childs was talking about, making sure that you know that that child is an individual. Whatever, whatever they like to do, you know, you don't stereotype it. You don't say, oh, like, you know, you're, you're a boy, so you should definitely want to go play football or, you know, be on the playground doing this. Like if they want to play with the girls or if they want to, you know, cook food instead of doing one other thing, they might have different interests, might be environmental, like everyone is different. And then also knowing, knowing the names of the students within your class. I know for me, just having like a simple, oh, hey, Danielle, or, oh, did you know this? Like Janae or Darius or Stephanie or Sydney, just saying everyone's name, that, that does a huge difference, just being able to speak to them as an individual. So that's awesome. what I want to say. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I was just going to say, getting to know your students individually is just very important. And I feel like if you get to know each of your student individually, it's going to come off genuine because you're going to treat each student the same and you're not going to make a, a big outburst for one student over here just because you're trying to show them that you're trying to get to know them. If you try to get to know each student individually, um, their background, what do they like to do, um, supporting them at sports events, um, academic events, just different things like that. I think that is what's really important. Awesome. Um, and you you guys just got a, an opportunity. Um, WVXU may, may uh, uh, they have an internship program, uh, Cincinnati Public Radio. So uh, if, if anybody's interested, we'll connect on that. Uh, this That's cool. That's cool. It's because they see your brilliance. So I wanted to say that publicly. Uh, Estefania. Yeah, so um, as a teacher, I think it'd be really great if it would, you know, if we could just encourage or accept practice acceptance of bilingual students. Um, a lot of times students are punished for speaking another language besides English, when in fact, right. America doesn't even have an official language. Um, mm. But, and you know, like, this isn't just for Mexicans or Latinos or Tam people. There's a lot of black people who speak Spanish, who are Puerto Rican mm -hmm. or Cuban or whatever it is, or Mexican. Right. You know, we can't forget about our indigenous Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just encourage just, um, you know, being allowed to speak Spanish or whatever it is they speak and not reprimand them for it. Um, and I think also just, you know, I think there's a way to show off a per like one of your students culture rather than singling them out. A lot of times in class, I know people are always like, oh, look, um, this is uh, something in Spanish. Estefania, you know, that was very uncomfortable for me. Um, so I think maybe practicing just subtle things or just, I don't know how to explain this, but uh, yeah, yeah, I guess just being accepting of cultures and language. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let me ask a question from uh, Mr. Frank Robinson. He's an, uh, an administrator at Northern Kentucky University. Thank you all for sharing your personal stories with us. It is an honor to listen to them this evening. Could you talk about how have your past experiences shaped you psychologically um, and uh, and also how it affects how you approach future conversations. So what, and you guys got into that. Uh, what do you guys think about that? The, the struggles that you've had, I guess as it relates to race and social class, how has that affected you so, so uh, psychologically? Um, I would say for me in terms of you, Frank had Frank had mentioned it, but yes, it does make me approach certain situations um, more cautious, whether or not I'm trying to um, evaluate if someone's an ally or not. I'm, it makes me constantly evaluate. I'm always in an evaluate, it's not an uh, analytical mindset, put it that way, where I'm trying to analyze and analyzing certain situations and whatnot, just to see, just because like, as a black man, you never know when you might be faced with something or whatnot. And it's just, you always have to have your guard up per se. And so most definitely my experiences do cause me to have my guard up and be more cautious when I'm approaching and going into certain situations and whatnot. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone one else uh, wanna take that one? If not, um, well, you can interrupt me if you want. And I do wanna uh, share some more comments. 
Uh, Kayla Stutz says, uh, my goal is to fluently speak Spanish for my future students. I like that one because that means Americans, we have to do the work because we always expect people to cater to us. Why don't they speak English? Why don't they speak American? And, <laughs> and uh, a lot of for people from foreign countries, they speak three or four languages and we, we speak one. We barely speak the English language. So I love it, Kayla. Thank you. Uh, Will says, Will Jones says, I want to, oh, oops, he said he want to be anonymous. Okay, so I'll come back to that one. Sorry. <laughs> um, I didn't get into that, though. So, um, Miss Williams Campbell said this was enlightening and educational. Um, Nicole, don't stereotype. One of the uh, suggestions, I think she says, you're tall, do you play basketball? Don't act afraid of me like you're afraid to approach me. Don't expect a reaction or act surprised that I seem intelligent. Well, I really like that one. I really like that one. Um, uh, I just want to get to some of these comments really quickly. Um, I just want to say that you all are awesome and I so appreciate hearing your honest words. Thank you, thank you. Keep going, don't give up. That's from uh, WVXU, State Public Radio representative. Um, uh, we're almost done with the comments. Uh, thank you all. This is from uh, Paula, uh, one, of, one of my current students. Thank you, Paula. Paula Marie uh, Gagne, thank you all for your time and for sharing your stories. I've enjoyed learning more from all of you. Appreciate your vulnerability. Me too. Me too. It's, you're very brave. Dr. Bondi, hey, uh, colleague from my friend from college. Phenomenal panel. Uh, many thanks to all the panels. This is like a family reunion. Thank y'all. Y'all showed up big. Um, when COVID lifts and we have a picnic, Y'all show up in the same way. Y'all just bring food, okay? Bring like ribs, chicken, show up big like this to like the picnic. <laughs> uh, all right, I think that's that's the comments. Okay, so any closing remarks before we uh, close out the discussion? And then I'm gonna give homework and we're gonna go. Anybody wanna share anything else that you didn't get a chance to say? All right. Um, I'll add one thing. Oh, yeah, please sorry. do, please do. Um, I will say, in the words of Dr. Maya Angelou, a lot of people don't remember uh, what you say, but they definitely remember how you make them feel. And as a person who is surrounded by educators, like I said, my dad's a college recruiter. My mom's actually a kindergarten teacher. I don't think I mentioned that, but just knowing like just treating everyone as an individual is so important, especially black and brown students. So as an ed educator, you have mm -hmm. a duty to make sure you treat people as an individual and you cater to what you're saying, being specific, but also just being genuine and knowing that those experiences will shape the way that they look at the future. You have a huge role as an educator just to make a big impression on them. So just always remembering the role that you're in is important and it takes, you know, those memories are things that students will take with them wherever they go. Wow, wow, thank you. Words of wisdom, powerful words of wisdom. Um, and it, it, if you could stick around, I did just for a little while, I'm gonna give you some homework, about a minute or so. Um, and then we'll be all done. I think, can everybody see my screen? Can you guys see my screen here? All right, awesome. Um, I really appreciate the panelists and, and, and all that you've done. This is your homework. Okay, so what I want to do is ask you to um, email, write down my email address. What are some actionable items you can do going forward that you can commit to? Okay, audience, uh, most folks are still here. What are some actionable items um, that you can do? Can somebody type my email address again in the chat, childsd1 at nku.edu. What are some actionable items? I want you to email me your homework this week and next week, okay? I'm gonna give you some ideas. Give you some ideas, actionable items. Here are some ideas that you might do. A, you can reconnect with a black and brown student on campus or in your sphere of influence or at work or in your apartment, a black and brown person. Uh, go on a listening tour, that's what I call it, of what they're going through. What do I mean by listening to her? A lot of times people want to tell us how we feel and tell us how we shouldn't feel. Listen to people like we did today. Uh, the, in this format, we didn't have a choice but to listen. 
Um, do that in your circle. B, you could also each one teach one, reach one. Take the information you learned today, grab another person, teach them some of the things you learned. You can do it uh, in person or you could do a social distance. You can have a Zoom chat or a phone call. C, you can volunteer or do service learning at a local school with a diverse population. B, get involved with the community events that are diverse. Um, the Greek community, the black, black and brown Greek community, the Greek orgs, B, 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 you can get involved with us. You don't have to be an NKU student. You can be involved uh, helping out uh, schools, free store, City Gospel Mission, that's a homeless organization in Cincinnati. Visit the Freedom Center, take notes, um, or you can donate to Black and Brown Educators of Excellence. Send us an email. Um, it's a student group. It, it may fund speaking engagements or uh, sometimes we travel to conferences and things like that. Um, so uh, F, read and respond to a short article on Democracy and Me or podcast. Um, Democracy and Me is a project that comes out of Cincinnati Public Radio. Um, I'll give you an ex uh, I'll show you where it is here. Demo uh, Democracy and Me articles and podcasts, and they have a division called Democracy and Z. It's a student podcast. And we want to invite uh, these folks here to be a part of that project as well. Um, there are articles that are written on this topic um, that, I, that you can uh, check out. And I'll show you the website here before we close. Or if you're interested in being a teacher, um, you can get in touch with us at Northern Kentucky University College of Education. We need teachers of, of every kind. This forum is about black and brown educators, but we need good teachers of any fashion, okay? And if you don't want to go to full teaching degree, we're developing micro-credentials, where if you are a business major, or if you are a theater major, or if you are a history major, or what have you, or nursing, you can take a few classes and get an education micro-credential, okay? And for example, cultural competence, if you're in the business world, definitely holler at your boy about that. Um, so let me show you one more thing and we'll be done. Uh, we're gonna end early because we're slated to be done at uh, 7.30. Um, Democracy and Me, this is the website here. Um, and there are different kinds of articles as it relates to civics, diversity, history, a lot of the things we talked about today. For example, one of the articles is Black Women's Lives Matter. And there are resources there that you can check out for teachers, um, but it just de deals with different information for the public and it's for educators. Uh, celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day gives the history. And there's a lot of civics kinds of things. Uh, reflections on the election, the electoral college. Um, so one of the homework assignments you could do, read a short article. These articles are only like, you know, it only take you maybe like five, 10 minutes to read. Uh, respond to it, okay? Send me an email response or you can post it right down here. I mean, the comment section um, on the homework, okay? And this is the College of Education website, all right. So uh, in closing, oh, there's other comments. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Any, uh, so we're gonna close out here. We thank you guys for being here. May his peace be with you till we meet again. May his peace be you till we meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time. We're going to do another one in the spring. So come back and see us. Bye.